from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So I am delighted to be here, absolutely thrilled to be introducing you to Siri Hustved. She's the author now of six novels, as well as a substantial body of nonfiction, including works on art and neurology. Um, she's a recipient of the 2012 Gaboron International Award for Thought and Humanities. Soon after we finish today, she tells me she'll be boarding a plane to New York and then tomorrow to Oslo, where she receives an honorary doctorate. Um, she's here today to talk about her latest novel, The Blazing World, which has been long listed for the Man Booker Prize. Um, I looked online, and I think there are just 13 books, so um, that's a huge honor. Um, and I think the shortlist comes in September. Wendy Smith, who reviewed the novel for the Washington Post, described it as an electrifying work with a titanic, poignantly flawed protagonist. Harriet Burden's rage, turbulence, and neediness leap off these pages in a skillfully orchestrated chorus of voices both dark and brilliant. It's wonderful to have Siri here to talk about this, and let's start right away with them. Um, this extraordinary figure, Harriet Burden, who is convinced that her artwork would have been better received had she been a man. Where did that conviction come from? And can you tell us about well, the personification? Well, this is, I mean, actually tracing uh, the origin of a novel once it's finished is quite difficult. Right. Uh, the story I've been telling, and I hope it's the true story, I'm not absolutely sure, is that it began with the idea of these masks. And the, you know right away in this book, because it's introduced by an editor who essentially tells the story. So the novel complicates and continues to complicate that story. But I had an idea of an, a large woman, a big, she's physically very big, as well. She's awkward. She's, she's, a, she's awkward, she's brilliant, and she feels that she's been neglected, that her artwork has been profoundly ne neglected, and she gets an idea to make artwork and give the artwork to three men. She seduces them in some ways. Well, it's not literal physical right. seduction, no. but she brings them in. They're three very different people, very different characters. And she has this fantasy that once the experiment is over, she will step forward in triumph and reveal herself as you know the genius behind the men, so to speak. And well, the, the story doesn't quite work out like that. But, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, that is the fantasy. And, um, and she is, I think that the Washington Post reviewer is exactly right. She's a very large person, and she's also flawed in the sense that tragic characters in uh, you know, old Greek tragedies can be flawed. Her flaw is a classic one, too. It's ambition. And I also think that it's not only about sexism in the arts, which does exist, but also about her psychological story. And so one of the things that intrigued me a lot in reading the novel was that you managed to create enormous suspense, and yet we know at the beginning of the novel many of the things that are going to happen and go wrong. And, and that's a process that's, that's interesting, because we become involved in the psyche, particularly of the protagonist, but of the other people. Yes. Yes, I mean, I, I know too early on I wanted to write uh, a book about perception, about how we see one another, and that, that our perceptions are always skewed. You know, there is no bird's eye view, you know, except God, of, <laughs> of, of, of what other people are. So each person, there are 20 narrators in the novel, each person has a different view of the same story, a different view of Harry. Uh, there are people who are very close Harry to her. Harriet. Harriet, so Harriet is, is Harriet. also Harry. So. It's a kind of uh, gender-bending name, Harriet Harry. And uh, so people very close to her, a beloved friend, her lover at the end of her life, her two children, all talk about her, but also more distant 
characters, art critics, uh, people who have interviewed one of the three masks, for example. Right. So there's a lot of material inside the text. And then we come to realize that things we think have been written by one of the male characters are, in fact, written by Harriet, right? So you're playing <laughs> games within the game that you've already created yes. with the authorial voice. In other words, uh, at one point, for complicated reasons that you would have to read the book uh, to find out, she takes on a pseudonym and writes a text under that pseudonym, which is also a kind of parody of academic discourse. It gets very complicated. And of course, this is not a very good way to reveal yourself. It's so obscure. And that's, I think, part of this character's self-sabotage. One of the things I most admire about this book, which has footnotes and um, <laughs> classical, biblical, philosophical references all the way through, is that it's also, in some ways, extremely modern in terms of being um, somebody who finds her life is divided into small sections of time, something you can pick up and read and become engaged with in very short sections and then feel you can't put it down. But if you have two minutes, you can read the next chapter, which is a very interesting approach to a, a big, substantial novel, but you've created in a way that, was that deliberate or am I just yeah, yeah, no, it's organized in a fragmentary form. And I, I have to say that this question of perception, my idea, which I've taken from the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, who wrote half of his work, not completely half, but a number of books under pseudonyms, and he called those works indirect discourse. And he said, the pseudonyms are not me. I don't believe what my pseudonyms believe. They're just, <laughs> put them over there. It's indirect discourse. And what I'm trying to do is deceive people into the truth. I mean, Kierkegaard was, wow. I mean, you want to go crazy? start reading Kierkegaard. I've been doing it for years. He'll drive you mad. But I, I, this was my idea that the reader would be thrown back on him or herself and have to find truths or meanings for him or sorry, herself. I'm, just gonna, that's I'm sorry. I'm, that's yeah. OK. We're, sorry. I think we should probably both take these off. OK. Now it will be more pure. Okay. Right. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm sorry. I was a little distracted then. But in terms of. Um, adopting these persona, obviously I, I was listening to a novelist earlier today who was talking about becoming the people he, yeah. he, he has in his novel. Here you, you, you have all these people who are authors of different sections of your novel. Um, there's from gossip columnists to critics to artists to, and also two different genders, the male and the female, there's a, there's a range there. How consciously did you think about whatever those personas are before writing in those different voices, the male voice and the female voice. It's a... No, of course, many artists, or many writers have done this before, m written books with multiple narrators. I personally had never done it before. Right. So it was a new adventure for me. And while I was writing the book, I wrote it in sequence. I began to think of it as my multiple personality disorder book. <laughs> and this is actually true, because rather than return to an earlier text by a character that repeats him or herself, I would wait for the voice to reappear. It was, I mean, it sounds, because I do not have multiple personality disorder, I'm quite sane. but. It did feel as if you were waiting to be possessed by that earlier voice. And the voices are very different in the book. So it was fun. But when I shifted voices, I could spend a morning just refinding right. Right. the cadences, the prose, the, the diction right. of, of, of one of the characters. Right. Right. You have to really live inside that person. Yeah. You. It's an embodied experience and not purely an intellectual experience mm -hmm. at all. It's feeling the music and in a way, yes, as the author said this morning, becoming the other. 
which takes me to something we were talking about a little earlier. Um, you're going to Finland and you'll be talking about, um, before a, a neurological group, I think, and talking about image and perception before a very scientific group. Um, and you have this interest in um, psychiatry, neurology, um, the workings of the mind and the brain. And um, in this novel, it seems to me, the border between sanity and insanity seems flimsy. They, they, is that, where does that come from, and can you help me understand that? Well, you know, Freud said somewhere, I can't remember where, that normal is at best a, a kind of working fiction. And I think that this, this is true. For four years, I was actually a volunteer writing teacher in a psychiatric hospital in New York. And that was a fascinating and profound experience for me. Not only because it turns out that some psychiatric patients are very good writers, uh, but also because I asked myself what you're asking now, which is, why are these people in the hospital and I'm not? You know? And I mean, this sounds, I know this sounds uh, uh, funny, but it really is about managing daily life. Uh, and that those people had landed in the hospital because they were right. not managing. Right. They weren't looking after them. Yes. Needs. On the other hand, almost every form of mental illness, I think, is a variant of our emotional realities. Mm -hmm. uh, so depression, we all suffer from sadness, and depression is, you know, sadness gone awry, if you will, too much sadness. And, and mania. I had some wonderful manic patients. I had a patient who wrote 7,000 pages in a matter of a few months. Ah, oh, yes. Very intelligent woman. Uh, but, of course, that's out of control. It's like an inspired writer, but Right. Too so the, much so, huh? Too much so. And so the creative process, in a way, though, seems to come from that, that hypomania that you talk about some in the book as yes. well, produces yes. words and thoughts and ideas that... Yes, and these borders, enormously. I mean, yeah, these borders are extremely interesting to talk about, I think, because uh, certain, what used to be called manic depression, which is now called bipolar disorder, Many poets, uh, for example, have suffered from this. I had some brilliant patients writing for me who uh, were suffering from bipolar disorder. So there is a creative aspect to psychiatric uh, illness. And psychotic patients are often said to have something called word salad. Word salad is uh, non sequiturs, uh, strange uses of language, you know, running off the rails. But of course, in a written text, this can be very interesting. And in a book that I own called Schizophrenic Speech, the authors uh, have printed a lot of texts by um, psychotic people. And then in one part of the book, they have an excerpt from. Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. And there really is a relationship that you can see uh, in the text. So where do we draw the line? Uh, I think it's about managing rather than right. creativity. Right, looking after, being able to look after yourself. Managing exactly. the day to day. Exactly. The very banal aspects of life. And very so banal, yes. Yet important. Getting up in the morning, having breakfast, right. going to work. Talking of which, you get up in the morning in a house in Brooklyn. Yes. Um, which you share with another writer. I do. And He's right over there. <laughs> who was Paul on stage, Oster. I think, yeah. earlier this morning. Tell me a little bit about the, the creative process. Well, you know, the boring thing is I usually get up very early because uh, I like what I call morning brain, which is that uh, if I'm up at 6 and at my desk a bit before 7, I have 
long hours of perspicacity. <laughs> About one o'clock, I can feel a certain fog coming in, and then I read. Uh, if I can, I read for three or four hours in the afternoon. That's my day. You read what you've written, or you read somebody else's work? Oh, no, no, I read to read. I read, read, to read. I read to read. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because this is a book that's so full, I, would, I could imagine being partway through this book and feeling, I must read up on my Kierkegaard, or was I right about, well. Yes. <laughs> right. Um, but no, you read to read. The, the paper, the. I read to read. I read um, science, I read philosophy, I read literature, um, I read psychiatry, psychology. Do you edit each other as well in that part we, of this process? Uh, we do uh, read each other's uh, books, and we are the first editor each for the other. Yeah. So I have another question I want to ask, but also we'll move soon to questions. So if people want to move to the mics, please do so soon. But um, I think looking around this room and hearing from other people here, Everybody would love to be long listed for the Booker Prize. <laughs> well, Tell us what that. <laughs> well, it's an honor too because it's the first year that Americans, Americans have been let in, and so there are four Americans out of thirteen, and uh, it's okay. When I when I first heard about this, what I felt instantly was not actually about me, but about my character, Harriet Burden who has felt so ignored. And my first thought was, Harry would be so Proud. happy. <laughs> I thought, oh, geez, this is so wonderful for, for her because she's felt so neglected. And in the novel, she's dead when, when the book starts. So she never gets to enjoy right. recognition, but you know, the interest in her in the fictional world of, of my novel, after she dies, people do become interested in her work, and hence this, these texts about her exist. But she doesn't get to live to have it. So, so fact, I'm is. having my 15 minutes on the long <laughs> list, and it, it feels good, but it feels even we better than be it's the for shortlist. Harry. I yeah. think it, shortlist is, is out in September, right? So yeah, we yeah. Hope you'll so be there. we'll see. Well, I can see. So um, I'd love to take a first question from um, over there. Go ahead. Um, it's wonderful to meet you today. And my question is, can you give some advice for people starting off writing novels? Mm. Oh, yes. It's a deep question, of course. Um, I've always thought that nobody can write without reading. That reading is where it all begins. And then a moment comes, and it, it came for me when I was actually writing poems, that I think my first publication was a poem in the Paris Review. I was so happy. And after I had published that poem, I got stuck. And every line I wrote, I scrutinized, you know, for its value to world literature. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I would look at Wallace Stevens and say, oh, God, I'm not nearly as good as Wallace Stevens. I mean, there's no hope. And I think that. After you read and read and read and know and know and know, there comes a moment when you, in a sense, have to leap over that. And what happened for me was that I was so stuck, I couldn't write anything. I talked to a friend and poet, David Shapiro, who said, Siri, when I get stuck, I do automatic writing, the way the surrealist did. I just write and write and write. And it's actually, David didn't know it was Pierre Janet who did automatic writing with his hysterical patients in the Salpetriere, another story. But anyway, I did the uh, automatic writing, wrote 30 pages in a single evening, spent the next two months editing them, and I had something that was unlike anything I'd written mm -hmm. before. And that pushed me over this notion of literary greatness or that, you know, I had to be as good as so-and-so and so-and-so. 
And I realized I could do something that was legitimate. Hmm? That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thanks so much. Um, I really enjoy your story, so I'm glad um, to have you here. Um, I'm a neuroscientist, ah, huh? and I'm really curious about how um, science and neuroscience data and research reach a fictionalized audience or fiction or non-science non writers. So when you look for, when you research your books, do you go to primary sources? Do you go to books? Do you go to the New York Times? Like how does, where do you look? Well, this is interesting. My interest in, in neurology goes way back. Um, I actually in college became interested in Christian mysticism and neurological conditions. Somewhere around 2000, someone, it, probably in the, in the late 90s, mid 90s, I began to read much more seriously about the brain and in neuroscience. And at some point, I was invited to a discussion group that met at Vile Cornell. Um, neuroscientists, psychiatrists, psychoanalysts, artificial intelligence people, there were between 20 and 30 of us every month. And that really helped me because I was able to listen to people in discussions about the brain-mind problem. And then I just continued to read and read and read and read. And now I read science papers and have accumulated data and information very easily. It wasn't easy in the beginning but now I can do it. <laughs> oh, hello, Siri. My name is Keith Cohen, and we just met this morning. But, That's right. Uh, I, I feel like since um, you're friends with some of my dearest old friends, like your husband and uh, David Shapiro, my roommate in college, I can ask you a question that will be edgy because of what you said about the embodiment of a voice. Um, and I think the, the audience at large might be interested in somebody like Henri Michaud. I, I know you know his work, but who on Mescaline began to write what you and David, I think, describe as automatic writing. Have you ever experimented with psychotropic drugs or other drugs? <laughs> no, no, and actually, no, it's an interesting question. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Uh, the reason is, is quite simple. Uh, I have, uh, I am a migrainer. I have had severe migraines since childhood. I've had auras uh, and all kinds of experiences, including a Lilliputian hallucination only once Oops. before a migraine. A little pink man and his little pink ox. Yeah. Ox, ox. Anyone from Minnesota will know it was right. a pink version of Paul Bunyan. <laughs> and, the little, and it was accompanied by very nice feelings. I do not need <laughs> hallucinatory things. I, I, think I already have a nervous system that's a little shaky, so I, I do my best to avoid I, I, thank you, and I, 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 I think you can probably, like Frank O'Hara, be high on your own thoughts. Yeah, thank you. You, you wrote about your nervous system in one. Yes, I, there is a book called The Shaking Woman or a History of My Nerves. Um, and it is, people, of course, I think they wanted it to be a great confessional book. In a way, it's not. I, about 10% of the book is about me and my particular symptom and experiences. Uh, and about 90% is reflecting on the symptom through philosophy, psychiatry, neurology, neuroscience. But that book actually uh, launched me into some of these uh, academic conferences where I talk about interdisciplinary approaches to various problems. So uh, it was not a massive bestseller. <laughs> as, as you this. might imagine, uh, but but in certain circles, including neurological and psychiatric circles, it's it's had a 
small success. <laughs> Let's take another question. From One of the things that I loved about the novel was introducing us to Margaret Cavendish. Did oh, I have the name right? right? I loved that I discovered her. Can you tell us? I didn't yes. know she existed. I loved it. No, okay. Margaret Cavendish is a 17th century natural philosopher, poet, and the author of a utopian fantasy called The Blazing World. I discovered her, oh, not all that long ago, 15 years ago. She turns out to be a remarkable figure. Uh, she was in, a royalist in exile in France. She was married um, to the Duke of Newcastle, who supported her writing. She was one of the few women of the period who published her work. There were other women writing philosophy that had their work circulated, but not published. Samuel Pepys called her an, an absurd or a mad, ridiculous woman. Samuel Pepys was the diarist who wrote about everything in, in, in England. Uh, she would often go out dressed partially as a man and partially as a woman. She was a really eccentric character, but now, it seems that some of her ideas are anticipatory of much later notions about the brain-mind. Huh. She was uh, a monist, right. which means she didn't believe that there was a, you know, a spiritual part and a physical part, but that we're all material. But she was also, unlike Hobbes, not an atomist, you know, she, and not a mechanistic thinker. She was an organic thinker, she, had, she has great little things about animals and sort of interspecies relations. She's a wonderful thinker. I recommend her to all of you. Um, a little wild and rather narcissistic, but fascinating. You know, all the, um, the maskings in the book, of course, about the art world, and I immediately wanted to ask you about maskings in the literary world. And last night I looked on um, tweets about Siri, and let me just read one tweet that, that <laughs> she probably doesn't even know about because no. I don't think she tweets. But um, as one wag put it, I'm waiting to discover that the latest works by Mitchell McEwan and Amos were actually by Siri Husband, <laughs> which is a, a, a play itself. But, but, but have you, I mean, George Eliot, I mean, where, have you, um, do, are there novels out there or will there be novels under men's names that will be? <laughs> I'm keeping it a big secret. <laughs> no, I think the novel invites that right. in a sense. It invites the idea that it can proliferate, that you don't really know where the book ends. And I have to say, even in terms of reviews, I normally don't read reviews. With this book, I've thought about all the reviews of the book as part of the book itself. Oh, well, that's very... Because Harry has this telling. idea that everything written about her masks is part of the project. So... Right. I have the same feeling about this novel, that it keeps proliferating itself. It is about itself. It's very it's, yes, yes. Is that a question? I can't is there see someone? There. Is there a question out there. No? Yes. Here's I someone. See. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. Yes. It's, it's enjoyable to hear you talk, but um, these are more like little comments of thoughts that came to my mind while you were talking, so maybe you'll have a comment. One is that many years ago I was volunteering at a day program for psychiatrically impaired patients and I've always remembered the words of a pretty partially controlled schizophrenic, shall we say, mm -hmm. young man who told me he couldn't work because the last time he worked, deducts flew away with all his cash. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It's a, no one would ever think of that image, you know. It's, no. But I'm sorry, it's not a question. No, no. Well, I'm, I, I think that one of the reasons that the four years I spent, and actually I'm working with someone now to uh, devise a writing program through Vial Cornell for psychiatric patients because I began to realize something I did not know going in, that writing 
actually did have a therapeutic effect on the patients, at least to the degree that when they left, they definitely felt better than when they came into my class. Mm -hmm. And there were testimonies from patients that that was the case. They were also, I think, allowed to use their verbal creativity in ways that the doctors didn't necessarily sanction. Yeah, huh? yeah, exactly. You understand that, right. that if word salad is part of your diagnosis, or the idea is to, it's a part of the pathology, the idea is to get rid of it. And yet there's something beautiful about this expressiveness, the right. unusual diction, for example. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to say is actually, um, well, my, my stepmother, who's uh, finally retired, is a fairly successful um, painter, artist, and she, when she became, um, when she started submitting work to, to shows and so on, changed her name to be, her first name to be Lee instead of Elise. Ambiguous. 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 Yeah. And this was a long time ago in the 50s. And, you know, actually she won an award in the American Watercolor Society and I don't think they knew she was a woman until she showed up to, uh, yeah. <laughs> to, to receive it. Yes. I mean, and so she, she felt at that time, I don't know, she didn't have much experience when she started, but she felt it would make a huge difference for her. Just well, I think one of my favorite stories is, is, I'm sure many of you know, but the way that orchestras became integrated, male and female, was simply that they began to hold blind auditions. Um, not because they wanted more women in orchestras, God forbid. I mean, they did not. Certainly not. What they wanted was to not be distracted by the appearance mm -hmm. of the performer. They isolated the judges from the performer, and suddenly, lo and behold. Amazing. Huh. Thank you. Lots of women. Lots yeah. of women. Yeah. Let's have another question from... Um, I do have a, just wanted to get your take on something, Siri. Um, my first name is Roberta, and I'm a poet, um, fairly well published. I've recently been submitting, Tell us your last name. submitting <laughs> things as yeah. Roberta oh, and oh. as Robert. And, as in, Robert. And, and not, and not sometimes Robert A. I, sometimes I call myself Robert A. I'm just so sick and tired of the whole thing that's going on in, in, in poetry and from the blurbs to gender questions to, I don't even identify as female anymore. I just say gender unknown. And <laughs> I just, I'm just, I've just had it. And, yeah. um, and the men that I talk to, the poets uh, that I, whom I speak with, sometimes I say, you had a panel, you didn't put a woman up there, we're all here. You, you, you know, you took, all these blurbs are from men. They don't even realize they're doing it, some of them. No, and it's, you know, this is the unconscious se sexism, but there really is a perceptual aspect to this, right? That uh, we fill in the blanks in our perception. So it's about expectation. And once these expectations are ingrown, then you will get perpetual biases unless they're made conscious. Well, now so I'm Robert getting a. kind Robert of a, a reputation <laughs> as this, you know, ball buster, for, for lack of a better word, and told that to my face, pushy, all these things, you know, that, um, oh. yeah. what's her name at the New York Times, Jill went through. And I just, do you have any advice when you get so sick of the whole thing? I mean, am I just supposed to well, start I calling think, myself I, Robert? I think, I just, you know, I think that uh, ambition, aggression, uh, and intellectual prowess, I will use that word, uh, in women is often punished. And the way to resist, if you will, is to accept that that is part of the game. And uh, my hope, of course, is that we will get beyond it. Okay. and have some fun doing it. Right, too. I was going to say, there's, there's a lot of humor and, and sport in this novel. Right. Yes, a, have some a, fun doing it. Right. Humor yeah. is a subversive business. Right. Yes. Humor is one of the most powerful subversive tools there is. <laughs> and so sometimes the right bit of irony, you know, the one thing that one must never get is really perturbed.
Mm. You know? Right. Or really angry or really hurt because you can't win. I try to I try to use humor to deflect with humor. It's my default, but <laughs> even <laughs> No, no. There are listen, I'm women smart. haven't had the vote in the United States for a hundred years yet. <laughs> huh? Think about it. That's one long lifetime, not a hundred years. So there's a road to walk. Thank you. Great. Nicely put. We have probably have time for a couple more questions. If one, um, your work obviously has many literary resonances, and one I found myself thinking about was Jekyll and Hyde, both because structurally of it being made up of a series of documents like The Blazing World, and then also because of the idea that Hyde enables Jekyll to do things that he couldn't do as his Jekyll personality. And I was wondering to what extent, even though all the artwork is by Harry, that she feels enabled to be a different artist when she is one of her masks than she would under her own name. Yes, I mean, uh, Jekyll and Hyde is, of course, one of the great double stories. Uh, I've always been interested in double stories. And the fact that for this person, it is not just that she's hiding behind these male masks, it's that she is able to become someone else by using the mask. So just as in Greek theater, masks are not disguises, but means of revelation. For Harry, she is finding herself in these, in, you know, she's finding in a way aspects of her own masculinity in these forms. And that includes aggression, some violent feeling, and uh, risky aspects of the self. But yes, I think it's, in that way it's a deeply psychological story the way Jekyll and Hyde is. I mean, there are many Freudian interpretations of that story, of course. It's like the id coming out. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a, oh, the question has disappeared. So I, do I get to ask another question, which I was hoping okay. for? So okay. we've talked a lot about, about Harriet and, and Harry and her, her, her male, uh, her decision to pre present herself as a man in some ways. But she's also a, a wife, a mother, a lover, um, a daughter. Mm -hmm. And these very female, her, her essences come out in a very powerful way in this novel. It's, and she's a passionate mother. She's a passionate, passionate mother. Passionate mother, and uh, the theme of birth, as she talks about uh, her children when they were infants, um, about giving birth when she's breast dying, feeding. and breastfeeding, and being pregnant. Um, it's a book where I think I wanted to mix up the metaphors, and of course, usually birth and creativity are metaphors used for men making books and works of art. But here we have a woman who's very much a woman who uh, adores her children and adored being a mother, uh, but who's also an artist. So what happens to the metaphors of creativity then? At one point, Harry's lover says that Harry is popping artworks out of her like wet, bloody newborns. And so that's you know, I wanted to, I guess, shake up the right. conventional metaphors. She's not giving up on her feminine side, even as she adopts this male artistic no, especially, persona. No, yeah. especially, Quite the opposite. She's, it's, she's giving... It's, you know, she says at one point that what she wants is hermaphroditic polyphony, which is, of course, a description of the novel itself. It's both sexes in one with many voices. Well, yeah. thank you very much, Suri. This has been good. <laughs> thank <you>. Fantastic. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.